We're recording in progress. <laughs> yeah. Man, I I was like a pack a day smoker until like 2013. And then someone told me about like smoking e-cigarettes to get off cigarettes. Someone and told I definitely, me. Yeah. I'm just trying I to definitely, hey, hey, kid. <laughs> Have you heard of this? <laughs> yeah, it was probably like a spy hired by the, the e-cig lobby. But Boy. I don't know. I'm like, it's the difference is like you're puffing on them. I mean, I definitely feel like physically better, but you smoke on them so much that it's like instantly when I wake up, I'm already in nicotine withdrawal, like reaching over to take the first puff of the day. I know, man. I can't fucking wait to get out to the studio to, you know, do my nicotine rituals, you know, pop my, what is it? It's four milligrams of Nicorette, which I'm doing like all day long. Hi. It's my Good fiance. Morning. I know. Oh, oh yeah, you guys met. Oh, we you met. Guys met. So yeah, very yeah. briefly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, what's but going on, this shit, man? man. Yeah, uh, just having a child. You know, living life. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. Trying to get out of my fucking studio. Trying to get out of my head, man. It's been like five years. I've been like, I literally think I locked myself in for like five years. I ha- I just haven't left. You know, like when I came to New York and met you, that was the first time I left the house in like eighteen months, man. Wow. I mean, I've left the fucking house I, in the neighborhood and shit. We would like, you know, what? we went to. Yeah, the- I know what you mean. You, you feel landlocked. Fully. I mean, we go to this gym uh, in our neighborhood. It was a speakeasy gym during the pandemic. Uh, they were like, fuck it, man. We're going to remain open. This is bullshit. You know, uh, so we, we would go to that. Petra and I would go to that. But literally, other than that, dude, I didn't go to a grocery store for like a year. That is fucking bullshit. And now it's mass up again in California, dude. As of yeah, well, midnight. Yeah, fuck that. I mean, California is the most absurd with these kinds of libtard rituals. These meaningless libtard rituals so everybody performs for one another. I love the contradictions fucking, of California. It's fucking crazy, right? What the yeah. fuck? Yeah. And it's just, I mean, you know, by putting all these masks on, like, you know, the fucking techno lords are just like, thanks, cool, awesome. There's another fucking several billions of dollars in our pockets. <laughs> Keep them on, dude. I know. Yeah, it's fucking Did you rad. hear that Bill Gates, like, was, um, Bill Gates got in on the mask game, like, very early. So, and he, and he's close with Fauci. It was one of the things that came up in Fauci's emails. I'm probably butchering the story, but it seems like he has a direct financial stake in never-ending masks. And now his stock is like, you know, number four buy. By the way, you're into fucking stocks, right? A little bit. I got some, yeah. I mean, I, I have some investments and in some like... <laughs> Maybe I, I don't know if I want my fans to know, to know all this. You're like, yeah, man, I'm invested in all this shit that I'm against. I mean, but fuck it, man. We're so full of contradictions at this point. It's just like, yeah. I mean, the thing is, I went to business school, man. I, my first degree was in marketing and microeconomics in Indiana University. And because, uh, man, I grew up poor as fuck, man. I mean, like at one point, I left home at 15. I was living in my friend's basement in a town of 300 people with one blinking stoplight, the fucking cop's name was literally named Cletus. No fucking joke. <laughs> and my fucking good friend, Johnny Braden, his fucking floors were dirt. He didn't even have real floors. And I'm like, Holy this fucking shit. sucks, dude. And then after fucking high school, I, I don't know how the fuck I made it out of high school. Uh, I was working in this, uh, some fucking cornfields for Asgro, cross-pollinating corn in like 100 degree heat with humidity. And my friend's like, I'm going to business school. It's like, that sounds fucking rad. <laughs> so, yeah. so then I was like, fuck it, man. This is how I'm going to pull myself out of this shithole, dude. I was like, I had no parental guidance or support. And I was like, I can't go to fucking art school. That's bullshit. <laughs> I right. wasn't even interested in art. I was like, art's for fucking idiots. You know, for like the facts. real shit is money. <laughs> fully, <laughs> fucking fully, dude. I was like, yeah. fuck this shit. I see all the artists that are at my school. And I was like, these bitches, man. They're all going to fail. And uh, yeah, yeah. anyhow, man, I went to fucking, yeah, business school and uh, whatever. Long story short, when we graduated, we had to make a fucking t-shirt slogan for our class. And it said, join us now or work for us later. And I was like, fucking amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then, uh, yeah, man. Uh, but 
anyhow, I, I got into art roundabout through that shit, man. I, uh, I took a painting class my senior year in college. And this dude, this is, I'm getting back to the stocks eventually. But uh, this dude was like, so I was taking this fucking painting class. And I was like, this is fucking amazing. I've chosen the wrong goddamn profession, literally. I was like, I held out to the very last fucking minute. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he was like, you're actually good at this, but you should not be an artist, dude. You're, you're going to go broke. You're in business. Just fucking continue that cycle, dude. He literally would bring professors in from other departments to try to talk me out of fucking being an artist. Like, sub <laughs> so like, subvertly, I was like, what the fuck? And, uh, oh, man, they were psyoping you. Dude, they fully fucking were. And, and so I worked in this fucking parking garage to, to be, remain unnamed. I figured out how to wire this fucking machine to rewire it. So it would print a smaller number on the receipt I had to hand in with my cash drawer uh, than what I would charge my fucking customers. And I would let all the students out for free. I was like, bro, don't worry about it. $20, that's too much money. But then I fucking took all this money. And then after school, I went around to Europe uh, for like six months on all this fucking embezzled, you know, parking garage money and just taught myself art history, essentially. And just went to like every museum and shit and all this. And, you know, like, you know, whatever, man. I like stay, I was like staying on the rooftop of hotels and shit. I was so broke. Um, came back, got a job in fucking Silicon Valley uh, with a company that did IPOs. Uh, and they actually didn't fucking hire me. They, uh, I went for the interview. I thought I fucking had the job. I was like, I got this shit easy. Mm -hmm. And then after the interview, I'm, so I'm staying in a fucking youth hostel that smells like curry. I'm just like, you know, I was the only <laughs> little fucking white dude around for miles. It was just Indians. And I was like, Boy, am I out of place, dude. And, and uh, it was in Mountain View, California. I had no idea what to expect. I thought Mountain View was like some like hilly little landscape with, you know, six people in it. Uh, yeah. But I showed this interview and they're like, bro, you don't like money enough. And I'm like, what? They're like, we can't hire you. And I was fucking devastated. I had like moved all my shit into this stupid youth hostel, two bags. <laughs> and, you know, fucking stinking of curry for like a month. And, uh, and I just started fucking showing up to this job in the back, um, like in the production facility. They made graphics for these companies that were doing like trade shows and shit. And so I just started showing up to work as if I got fucking hired. And they're like, yeah, I was like, yeah, where do I do? <laughs> like, oh, well, you can hold this shit and do this. And then the project managers also worked in the back. They would go on lunch and I would be like, yo, I'll watch the phones. I got it while you're gone. It's no problem. And so like two weeks into this shit, uh, one of the project managers had a fucking mental breakdown because it was bullshit. I mean, people were like sleeping under the desks and shit, dude. It was like high. It was 1999, man, to fucking date myself. Uh, so it was like high Silicon Valley, high crest of the fucking first wave. And uh, they were like, well, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> You're hired, dude. Be a fucking project manager. Yeah. So I was doing that shit, man. And uh, I, I was taking painting classes at night with this fucking ex-Special Forces Vietnam Sergeant, uh, Skip. And after two years of this <laughs> bullshit, dude, Skip, I know, fucking Skip. That's perfect. So Skippy, Skippy got me a fucking, after two years of fucking taking night classes with a bunch of old ladies, he was like, bro, I got you a scholarship to the Art Institute, San Francisco Art Institute, like, go. And I was like, done. And so then everything fucking crashed to shit. And uh, I was fucking squatting in a cookie factory, which a bunch of, you know, a bunch of fucking artists and people that were studying artificial intelligence. And then uh, that was that, dude. And then I just fucking went on. But, but still, regardless, I had no money to manage then. So I had all this fucking business knowledge. But it wasn't until, you know, 2016 that, that Petra and I started actually making money. And really? Uh, really, like, well, 2015. Yeah, 2015, dude. Yeah, wow. we both got we both got sober, you know, whatever, full disclosure, on Christmas Day of 2013. And that's when shit started changing for us, dude. I mean, we were fucking retards, dude. <laughs> like, full That's the blown same year that idiots. I got clean. Yeah, good. Yeah, exactly, man. It was the best fucking thing we could do, man. But when we met, we met in a hot tub, which is hilarious. And I was yeah, like, Yeah, my, my fiance up? loves the story. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> him and Petra's, Petra's marriage story. The hot yeah, tub. Yeah, man. 
Dude, that was fucking hilarious. She moved in basically the first night. But it was chaos, dude. And, I bet. Uh, I, I was putting groceries on credit cards. I was like, I had just gotten out of the intellectual sweat lodge of USC. I, I don't know why the fuck I went back to grad school. That was idiotic. Uh, <laughs> fucking stupid trash. You know, you know, I actually had, if not like a, the same, like same trajectory, but kind of similar. I guess first I should just do this. Welcome back to System of Systems, everybody. This is your host, Adam. I am heading out on vacation tomorrow, so I wanted to get another episode in with a friend of mine. Ben is on the lam, but he will be back. And I am here with the artist from Los Angeles, Mark Horowitz. Mark, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me, man. I love it. Big fan, dude. Oh, sweet. All right. So where were we? Yes. All right. So my trajectory, I definitely didn't grow up broke. I was pretty much uh, solidly petty, bouge, Jewish kid. I mean, but like, I, was, I grew up on Cape Cod. I was the only Jewish kid I knew. Oh, but, dude, um, just for the record, I was the only Jew in Southern Indiana. People were like, Horowitz, what kind of name is that? I mean, it was like, <laughs> fucked up, dude. And I played football. I was like, for sure, the only Jew within like hundreds of miles playing football. Yeah, did you know. your friends do Jew Jewish jokes all the time? Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah. none of them were Jews. And I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, what's the difference between a pizza and a Jew? I'm like, okay, I know where this is going, dude. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, okay, Yeah, thanks. exactly. <laughs> yeah. But um, <laughs> I went to college. I mean, I kind of did want to do something creative, but my dad is such, like, a business-minded libtard that he was like, no, you got to do something practical, you know? So originally I was trying to study photojournalism at University of Arizona. And I actually did pretty well. I did this photo series once that got like national attention. Uh, I was photographing this group called the Minutemen Civil Defense Corps, who were those people that like hung out at the border with rifles and Miller High Lives trying to scare away immigrants and whatnot. Sounds like all of Indiana, dude. <laughs> yeah. And it was just like, yeah. just like a neutral kind of like look into these people. The woman who ran it was funny as shit. She was this woman named Carmen Mercer. She was a Russian immigrant who ran a saloon in Tombstone, Arizona. But, um, yeah, it was cool. I, I didn't like, I tried not to pass any, I mean, at the time I was still mad libtard. So I was like pretty disgusted by the way that they thought. And I guess I still kind of would be, but, um, but then like instantly I just, I was like photojournalism. How am I even, this wasn't even any more practical than like any of the other stuff, you know, like how the, there's like, there's like 50 photojournalists in America that, that work for the newspapers. So at that yeah. point, I just started experimenting more with like other kinds of stuff. I do own a little bit of stock just because like my only goal, I'm a decadent aristocrat. I'm terrible at working, you know, even though I think like work is important, I don't want to do it. <laughs> so, like my only goal yeah. is to not like have to work at all and just do this kind of stuff. Well, that's good, man. I mean, I, I, I'm of the same mindset, you know, I'm from like the culture of like salvation through work, you know, this sort of Calvinist uh, approach to, to everything. And, you know, uh, so yeah, and there's like that integrity that's like built into me, man. And, you know, coming over from like the business world into the art world, like when I showed up at the San Francisco Art Institute, like that first week, man, I was like, what the fuck is this chaos? Like, this makes no sense. Yeah. Like, where's the organizational structures? Like, what the fuck is actually going on? Right. You know, and it's still, man, to this day, it's still, it's, it's the fucking art world makes fucking no sense to me. It's a trash fire. You know, it it's like, there's no meritocracy. There's no, it's all just like fucking smoke and mirror bullshit, you know? And it's just everyone massaging everyone's backs and just clicks and clubs and like, I don't know, man. I'm just, I'm fucking over it. Yeah, you know? I feel like very lucky to be in the position I'm in now where I'm basically like disconnect. I, I mean, I'm like, 
I have like one foot in, one foot out, but I have no reliance anymore on any kind of institutional structure. It's like, but I mean, I work really, really hard at the stuff that I do. Like I write like 12 hours a day. I just, you know, I was working day jobs at museums, like most of my like late twenties and shit. If I had to go back to something like, you know, the worst thing would be is because I was already like, I had shown like when I was still making visual art, I had shown it some places and I had started writing a little bit and it would be like the humiliation of like, uh, you know, running into someone that knew me from the scene or whatever. And I'd be there like tour guide wearing the outfit with the name tag and whatnot. It'd be fucking. It's like, it's like community service. It's like being spotted in high school doing community service at the fucking yeah, exactly. fair. Shit. No, oh. it used to bum me out so bad. <laughs> Especially if like they sort of knew me and they do a double take, like this guy looks mad familiar. Yeah, exactly. And you're like, oh fuck, bro. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean I fucking fell into that trap for many, many years, man. And like that was like, you know, as an artist, that's what you're sort of fed. Like, yeah, if you're not if you're not, you know, mainlined into the institutional system, you're a fucking piece of shit failure. Like you're totally the losers of history, you know? And, and like, that's bullshit, dude. That's like, that, that shit needs to stop, yeah. <laughs> you know? And this whole, this whole narrative of like, when you see artist friends and things like that, and like, I mean, I fall prey to this sometimes too, man, but it's just like when other artists are like, oh, which shows do you have coming up? It's like, it's immediately like measuring like where you are in your Dick fucking career. Contest. Yeah, exactly. And you're like, I don't, I'm just taking the summer off. I'm like, <laughs> like <laughs> I'm just taking the year off, man. It's like, you immediately you're like, okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's just the, yeah, the fucking pissing contest, dude. Yeah, you know, and I, you, like, you like to think that like um, people that are like, really great at what they do immediately sort of rise up but i mean i had this friend uh, alex hardashnikov actually i don't know if you can see it that's his painting right there in the towards the yeah. left yeah, of yeah, me. Yeah. but he's like one of the best painters i think like around right now and he's still he's i mean he's had shows and whatnot but he's I, I did the first interview with him ever, and then he kind of dropped off the face of the planet. Now he has a show coming out at 15 Orient. But I mean, like, point is, um, the art world right now doesn't like reward pure formal genius or whatever. It's it, like, like not even close to anything rewarding like actual greatness. No, man, it, it doesn't. And like, you know, I was just reading this book, uh, The Dupe of Being. It's written about Carol Appel. Mm. And uh, that dude's a fucking genius, man. Holy yeah, fuck. totally. Oh, you know, but there was that, like, it's gotten so complicated or something. I don't know what it is, man. But, like, he was just, like, he could express all this emotion and this, like, and, and his sort of, like, punk qualities through the plasticity of paint. And it's, like, what the fuck actually happened to that? You know? I know. Like, like why, do, why does every artist have to be a fucking politician now? And like, I can actually you know, see his like influence on your work a little bit with the, the clashings of the, the primary colors and whatnot. For sure. I mean, I saw when I was on this like stolen trip to Europe, you know, uh, I, I went to the museum and I think in Holland, yeah, it was out by the sea. And I saw his work for the first time, his sculptures and his paintings. And I was like, like I had, I had no idea what contemporary art was, first of all. And I was just mm -hmm. like, I'm going to paint like Velasquez. I mean, I thought that for fucking many, many years. And I'd see contemporary yeah. art when on this trip, I would go to these contemporary art museums. And I'm like, what the fuck actually is this trash? This is fucking bullshit. You know, I was like, yeah. this is some poser ass shit, dude. Yeah. You know, and it literally, you know, I was exposed to it in San Francisco at the Art Institute. Um, but yeah, man, I just, I, I don't know. I mean, am I like a fucking Luddite or something and thinking like, why don't we just go back to like some simpler times? You know, I don't know. Like maybe I'm in a fucking anti-accelerationist. I don't, I don't, I don't know, you know, but like, uh, I just feel like shit has gotten so complicated and this burden that the fucking neolibs have placed on artists to be these like shamanistic fucking political, like 
truth sayers is bullshit, dude. It's fucking yeah. bullshit. Yeah, we're, but- we're idiots. We're just putting some paint on some fucking canvas and like, you know, or what the fuck ever. Like, whatever. Yeah, and of course, like that truth telling is all is usually just like a thin mask for knowing exactly what to say to flatter the ego of the people who actually run the shit. You know, um, there's a do you, do you read Angelicism O1's blog at all? No, I don't. I'll put I'll put you on to him. He's okay, fucking, please do. He's a I know him a little bit, like the person behind the blog, but um, he's like an amazing. I probably shouldn't even gender the person because it's supposed to be anonymous. But the person behind the blog. It. it. Uh, yeah, it, it. It behind the blog. The entity behind the blog uh, exactly. was writing something about um, like the whole like Aria Dean and Hannah Black phenomenon where no one really actually knows what they do for art. Like, I don't, I don't know what Aria Dean's work looks like, but I know who she is. She's like, you know, I don't either. (laughs) Like she's, but she's incredibly famous, merely, and Hannah Black, same thing. Like everyone knows who she is. I don't know what her work looks like. I just know that she writes fucking letters to the Whitney every four years. Like, and that's become the driving force behind her career. I mean, that's like a very new, like sort of, phenomenon the fact that you don't even really need to make art to be an artist you just have to like tear down the career of someone else uh tear down the career of someone else in like a public forum yeah and then build your scaffolding around that shit i mean it is it's fucking crazy building your scaffolding around like decaying someone else's like burgeoning career like that yeah may or may not uh, you know, rely on like authenticity and fucking like realness. Like it's yeah. fucked up, man. You know, I, I, I think like, oh yeah, man. I mean, yeah, this whole thing, man, of like these artists that get sort of ushered in to the, to these like, to the ivory tower, you know, that is the cultural institutions and grad schools and things like this. It's bullshit, man. It's just like, again, it's to, to serve that, that sort of propaganda, that motive, you know, and it's like, I mean, for me, like, like uh, yesterday, I, I was in this show in Chinatown, uh, and it's like a group show, Chinatown, 1998 to 2008, and it was just kind of hung salon style, and uh, it was cool. It was a cool reunion. Chinatown was fucking rad back then. It was punk and just like yeah. nobody gave a fuck, and just we're having shows and getting drunk and just being fucking humans there wasn't Kordansky and his fucking 30,000 square foot arms race to the fucking top you know and, and, and like it was just a fucking different time but th- my point is like I was looking at these three paintings on a wall and they were so fucking dramatically different and I was like I wish to god that was the same artist you know I think Van Hanos is doing that a little bit I went to a show uh, at Listen when I was in New York um you know, but I would just love, for me, I just love fucking twisting and turning and just like being sort of antithetical to the market and to like people's expectations. For me, I feel like that's what art should and should do. I feel like it yeah. should bunk against that fucking system of like, yo, bro, just c- keep producing the same shit over and over again. So like I can have one and my friend can have one and my friend's friend can have one and we're all in the fucking club. It's yeah. like, it's fucking bullshit. Like, yeah. it's just, it's like another form of like virtue signaling, like at a fucking elite level, you know, and yeah. this whole thing well, about portraiture, you know, it's just like portraiture, please come on. Why is it popular? Because like, you could see exactly who fucking painted that. And you're like, oh, I'm supporting, I'm, yeah, I'm supporting this community. This is what I'm like, oh, kudos on me. And then in two years when fucking abstraction comes back in vogue everyone's gonna dump that shit it's gonna be right. like worth nothing dude like, right it and serves uh, nothing i'm not a trotskyist but trotsky actually had an interesting take about this because basically that kind of painting amounts to a sort of social realism it's just like oh look at these people and feel their struggle but trotsky like uh, he rejected social realism publicly because he said when, you, when you're when you just showing something, you're just like validating, you're basically reaffirming that it's okay that like 
this pain or whatever exists. Whereas art is actually supposed to express the alienation, the psyche, uh, the feeling that the artist has against the world that he's in. I feel like that has kind of been abolished, but I'm getting it from every fucking which way this week because I'm in, I'm in both like, I'm in a fortunate circumstance, which is I kind of exist in multiple spheres at once. Like I'm in literature, art, music to an extent and politics. And I have a myriad people that hate me in every single one of those. <laughs> Good scenes. for you, man. <laughs> yeah, like, that, like this You know week, when you're successful. When yeah, I know, it <laughs> happens, it happens. I don't mind people like, here's my thing. I don't mind if people talk shit about things that I've actually done or said, but when they're straight up lying about me, I can't even like, you can't even really approach that. So this mm. week, uh, I don't know if you heard about this, but Dom Ferno, AKA Prurian or Vatican Shadow noise musician. Shit. You're frozen. Oh shit. Let me know when I'm back. Okay, you're back. You're back, you're back. So uh, Dom Fernow, he's a pretty famous noise musician and techno producer, but um, he's had like associations with Nazi black metal bands for like ever. Everyone's always known this. It's like, he's like a corny edgelord, you know? Who is it? Who is it again? Dominic Fernow, he runs a label okay. called Hospital Productions, which is like bisecting okay. noise and techno and black metal. But uh, this week, some fucking not like failed techno producer, non-playable character type wrote a Substack article that basically just reiterated all these public connections that Dominic has always had and we've always known about. But he wrote it in such a way that was like, you all must be mad about this now and of course everyone has such little spine they either are like yeah i've always been really mad about this or they they just capitulate to it somehow but i got a lot of the article was focusing on the fact that journalists haven't um like publicly condemned dominic enough and i'm thinking to myself well what the fuck are they supposed to do dominic are you a nazi no. Are you sure? Yes. It's like, okay. <laughs> you know, but um, they brought up. Okay, they br check. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They brought up, they brought up the website that fired me, this guy, last year. And they said that I was fired for platforming Nazi noise musicians, which is a total lie because the, the magazine specifically asked me not to. Uh, so I never did. I was fired because I'm friends with DC Miller. That was basically the whole reason. But the fucking magazine is such a cowardly faggot piece of shit. <laughs> they, they, they didn't even correct the record about their own innocence. They were just like, yeah, we have to try harder. And it's like, I don't know, that level of cowardice where you can't even just like, hey, actually, that's not where, how it went down. It, it makes no fucking sense to me. And it's like, that shit is everywhere now. People will watch their best friend get buried alive and say nothing. I know, man. It's, it's McCarthyism, man. It's just like, it's just like this sort of, you know, people want their individualism. They want all their, you know, whatever rights. You know, but then it, it, essentially no one has any rights, whatever. Everyone has become a fucking policeman though. It's just fucked up. It's just like, everyone's pointing fingers at everyone. And it's just like, what fucking good is this doing anything, dude? It's like literally taking culture and putting it into a fucking hole, dude. It's Abolish like- Abolish the police like, and then become the police. Uh, right. <laughs> it's just like, what in the actual fuck are you thinking, dude? Like, no one thinks anymore. I, what the fuck is happening? Is this just because, like, I mean, a lot of me believes that, you know, this, you know, sort of, like, I, I agree with Mark Fisher in that, like, a lot of this stems from, you know, mental health, you know, healthcare, yeah. and, and, and education, dude. Like, fully. Like, our education system is so fucked. And if you don't have any fucking money, you're fucked now. You know, yeah. like, we're going to have to put our son through school 
And no joke, dude, kindergarten is, if we want to put him in the school that I want him to go to, which is not fucking like woke and bullshit, you know, where they're <laughs> teaching him that like there's gender fluidity at like age five, like, no, dude, I don't want that to fucking happen. I'm fucking sorry. <laughs> But, like, let the boy be a boy first and figure it yeah, out, you know? I mean, fucking come on. And so if we want to put him in the school, it's $30,000 fucking thousand dollars a year, dude. You know? Oh, my and, God. Yeah, no fucking joke, you know? And it's just, like, it, everything is just, like, the ratio of the middle class, it's gone. It's been gone for some time. And, and, and it's just, like, what the actual fuck, dude? Like, our education system is fully failing us, and this is the result, I think, man, personally. Yeah, I think a lot of it is also we live so online that our mind has become, like, an algorithm all on its own. So you're, like, you're, like, your attention is directed by, like, web traffic almost. So if you totally lose yourself in the nature of how the kind of culture disperses information now, you end up just becoming a part of the algorithm. You're just, like, another one of, you're, like, a piece of the information that is, like, directed at that thing. Oh, I'm supposed to hate Dominic Fernow now. Oh, I'm supposed to uh, think Hannah Black is a fucking courageous revolutionary for justice or whatever it's it's like and it and and it becomes like it's like you actively have to you have to be so conscious all the time just to like stick to who you are that it becomes yeah. exhausting almost so most people are just it like is. fuck it i'll just go with it yeah no shit i mean it's just these like it's like these information eddies almost you know where you just fall into this swirl and, 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 you know, that's just where you're going to be, dude. And you're just fed the shit that you put out. And it's like, everyone's like just nodding in these little fucking circles, like jerking each other off. It's like, I yeah, mean, you know, up their ass, like, I mean, us included, maybe, you know, I can include us in that too, but no, like, definitely. I mean, but like, it's just set up for that, man. I mean, you know, and, and like, at the end of the day, who does this serve, man? Who does the masking serve? Who does like, you know, all this fucking strife and struggle and all these fucking riots and, you know, all this bullshit just serves the motherfucking technocrats. They're like, yeah, fucking split up. When, when fucking, when, when, a D, when I'm a huge sports fan, you know, disgusting B Cleveland Browns fan, um, yeah. you know, diehard dude, motherfuckers have lost. They've never won a Super Bowl. They're a piece of shit team. They only started fucking <laughs> winning in like the last like three years. I've like literally like Petra fucking hates it when football season comes around because I'm fucking miserable. Um, but so I was watching the Super Bowl and an ad, an Adidas ad comes on and there's a fucking drone shot of Melrose during the BLM protest and they made a commercial out of this shit, dude. That says it all right there. I mean, that's it, dude. That's fucking it. That's it. You know, you know. It, it, it just go just to say one other thing like it goes back to hurricane katrina i was uh i was i think i was in grad school i was just like recently in grad school after hurricane katrina and this artist rickeret tier geneva i think is his name came in and he was speaking and then I, I i liked him i was like oh i like his work and then we had a round table and I started fucking hating this dude, <laughs> you know? And I was like, bro, you're so full of contradictions. He had a show and he had all these artists draw all this shit for him and never credited him. And I was like, I was like, is anyone fucking seeing this? And so I raised my hand and I was like, hey man, so what the fuck is the difference between you and Tide? When Tide has, makes an ad of them doing people's fucking laundry in, 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 in New Orleans and Hurricane Katrina and they make a fucking ad like they're doing great things by just doing a few loads of fucking laundry. By and then they selling make a fucking people ad. detergent. Yeah. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then they make a fucking ad out of it and they're like, oh, we're great. We're a great company. We do fucking, you know, fucked up people's laundry. It's like, what? Like, what's the difference between you and this company? And like, I got kicked out of the room. They're like, Mark, you should leave. This is like Holy inappropriate. Shit. Yeah, man. And he was yeah. like pissed. I was like, what the fuck? Anyhow, anyhow. You know, I really think the, I think the athletics example is a great one though, because the NFL used to be, and still is to a large degree, a huge enterprise all on its own. 
and they sure as hell are not benefiting financially from doing politics. That's not like what the majority of its audience wants. So I think it just shows that platform capital has really supplanted like older forms of marketing because the NFL is reliant on Google and Apple. Like, so they, it, it makes sense for them to alienate their audiences a little bit because they need those platforms available to them. I mean, ultimately, really all of this has just kind of uh, hardened the influence and power of platform capital, I would say. But, uh, you know, I, I was curious because I've read this story about you before and I wanted to ask you about it. Didn't, oh, Bruce, Han- didn't Bruce Hanley call you a Nazi once? <laughs> well, let me, I, I just, uh, yeah, he did, he did, he did, he did. But I wanted to, so I wrote this down the other day and I was thinking of you. I mean, and this is like probably passe to read something I wrote, but like Foucault wrote this. He said, a state under the supervision of the market rather than a market supervised by the state. And that's where we fucking are. Dude. That's where we are, like yeah. 150 fucking percent. I mean, I'm not like dense into Foucault, but like I read that and I was just like, yeah, done. Well, that's his, where we're at. some of Foucault's, I mean, um, I was kind of really into Foucault when I was in my early 20s. And then I became more a Marxist. So I was like, you know, a lot of Marxists are very like, oh, he's not a Marxist, blah, blah, blah. So like they shouldn't (laughs) fucking read him at all. But I think he had a lot of valuable insights, especially about uh, biopolitics and like what happened during the pandemic in which um, the bare like survival of, of human bodies like took precedence over anything resembling an actual society or human life. I mean, he had a few insights that were really kind of key to where we're at right now. But um, I don't know. Where were oh, we Bruce at? Hanley. Bruce oh, Hanley yeah, calling, Bruce me, Hanley, calling Bruce me, Hanley. Call, calling me Hitler. <laughs> yeah, what happened there? Uh, I was like, bro, do you do you see my last name? So so I, I when I got a, when I when I got accepted to USC grad school. Um, the, the timing of this wasn't great, but I was given a grant by Creative Time. Uh, in New York to do a project called Advice of Strangers. And it was, I, I don't know, looking back on it, I don't know how great that project was. I just let the website die and like, go away. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, but so anyhow, so I built this whole platform, you know, with a programmer where people could, you know, vote on my fucking daily actions and see like where the fuck it took me. You know, at one point I was like, voted to rob a bank with my fucking mother in Sacramento. And I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, I remember the fuck is wrong with you people, that, yeah. dude? And, and, and so anyhow, so like, you know, obviously I was coming up with a lot of these questions, you know, but then I started pulling for other questions from users or from, from you know, people that were like watching. And, but Bruce was like, dude, you're a totalitarian. You're making up these questions. Like this, uh, this whole thing is fabricated and it's bullshit. And I was like, what the fuck do you think like the whole world is, first of all? That's the point, right, right, right. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, like, okay, bro. Like, if you want this to be uber democratic, like, whatever, that's a whole other fucking conversation and project. So, but he goes on in in his crit at USC, he like does this thing with his like, you know, finger above his mouth. And he's like, yeah, he had like a little, uh, you know, toothbrush mustache, that guy. Oh yeah, Hitler, you're kind of like him. And I was like, I mean, I didn't even know how to respond. I was like, bro, what the fuck are you actually on about? Like, you, yeah. you're taking it to that level? Like, I'm doing some fucking stupid project online in grad school with creative time? Like, what? It's just the, the fucking, like, the hyperbolization, the, just like the, the, the quickness of, 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 like, taking it to the extreme with these people, man. It's like... Did the students kind of fucking, did they get riled up? And- they got riled up, man. I was so fucking hated in grad school. <laughs> I was I was a fucking pariah, dude. I was oh, like, man. oh my God, dude. I'm there with my business degree, my football watching, my fucking like mental problems from playing football, whatever the fuck has happened to my brain as a result, dude. It's just scrambled eggs up there. And, uh, and, 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 and I had one year of fucking undergrad art school haven't read like a lick of theory 
like I didn't know Foucault from fucking Marx at that point, really. Right. And, uh, and, and and like all these dudes are hailing from like Brown and Yale and Harvard and fucking you know every Ivy League fucking school in the country, and I'm just a fucking country bumpkin, dude. And uh, and all I could do honestly in critiques was just make jokes. I was just like. I just was like, this is so fucking stupid. And I actually at one point brought in like a friend who was like a blogger and she was like, this is so miserable, dude. I don't know how you're doing this, but like, what, get the fuck out of here, dude. It's ruining you. Right. You know, she's like, these people are mentally fucking ill, you know? And I was labeled as the one that was mentally ill. You know, I was the fucking like piece of shit And, and you know, I don't know, man. It was like a, it was a weird experience, man. It was well, like art school, fuck. art world elites like that, like Hanley, they just have like such contempt for the, for like ordinary people. And they're so isolated. They don't really have to think about it. You know, they can just write off entire communities as totalitarians. But to me, that's like a very smart critique, the way that you kind of engineered the project because it's, like if I was, I mean, I am smarter than Bruce Hanley, but if I was teaching, <laughs> I mean, if I, if I was teaching the class, I would have said, this is like a, you know, I wanted to intellectualize that I'd be like, this is a commentary on control society. Like, boom, obviously. Fucking boom, dude. You know? Yeah, man. And so, okay. So this was like right at the beginning of the downfall of USC because of all the, the politics, you know, Charlie White, he's a fucking genius, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I love his work. He's a, dude, he's a goddamn genius. So he was head of the department. I have immense respect for him, man. You know, and he was a, an, an amazing sort of mentor and instructor. Like, props to him. But, um, at, at, like, I was in grad school 2010, 2012. So around 2012 was when the new class came in, and it was all this fucking woke culture. And this girl, whose name I can't even fucking remember, dude, um, was like, uh, she was showing some work that was like, it was a fucking terrible, unwatchable video of her and her boyfriend. I don't even know what the fuck they were doing. They were in a fucking park, parking lot, like filming pigeons and people and shit. I was like, this is fucking trash. And then she had drawn like a hand-drawn map of some bullshit and was like, like highlighted, you know, places of conflict or something. I mean, it was so fucked. And I was, and she was just talking about <laughs> politics. And I was just like, again, I was like looking around the room and I was like, is, is anyone getting this shit? And I was like, yo, why don't you just fucking join NPR? Like why even be a fucking artist? <laughs> like just get a job at NPR, like be a yeah. fucking social worker. Like literally, if this is what you want to do, this is trash art, first of all, like, but just go and, and get you know a job at NPR that be better serve you and your community and the people that you're trying to highlight, you know. And then she went on and got all these fucking accolades, man, in the art world, of course, and like is doing like immensely well. Um, but I, I I don't know, man. It's just like that's like part of me is like these people that want to do all this like virtue signaling and all this like th- this work that's based around. I mean, there is room for political art. Don't get me wrong. It's been going on for fucking ever. You know, it's like really since the dawn of time, but it's just gotten so fucking extreme and so like atomized that uh, that it's it's like it's it's like a fucking wildfire. Well, you know? also like um, it's like I, I, of course there's value in political art for sure. I mean, but I, I mean it's almost hard to see this as even political. Like I would love like an artist to to make a project about how. BLM is basically a petty bourgeois scam of upward mobility, but nobody's going to touch that right now. So like, you know, over the last, since Trump basically, but it's been going on much longer than that. You know, there's been basically a, a congealing of interest between the state, uh, big capital, and sort of like uh, NGO networks. And the art world sort of has its own kind of like NGO arm. So Mm. whereas art is typically a place of like rethinking uh, society and your place in it, it's become another like sort of arm of the state in which 
uh, it's, you know, it's aimed at its own specific audience of uh, bougie pseudo intellectuals. So they can all sort of keep, I mean, like, uh, we're at this place now when like, even like normie kind of liberals, like, they think like the most retarded things I've ever heard in my entire life. It's like kind of mind boggling the amount of bullshit that people have actually like, like accepted. And it's like every single day they're told they have to think something else. So like they keep sort of taking on more and more incoherent positions. But I mean, like it would be really valuable. I think if there was genuinely political art that said something different or pointed out something that pointed out something like a contradiction that these people are unwilling to deal with but as of yet i mean for instance like i have this friend uh i have this friend he runs a gallery and he's a black guy but he, he doesn't he's like sort of idiosyncratic in his views so he never gets put on those like top 35 dealers under 35 or whatever even though he has the identity they like to fetishize of like young, good looking black guy. He wanted to do a show called uh, How Race Politics Dilute Class Struggle or whatever, but he couldn't get any funding because uh, no one would like even give him the time of the day on the project, even though he like identity wise could have probably pulled it off. It's just the, the art world's role is not actual critical thought. It's it's inundating you with the same, like, I mean, the average, like, political artwork now has the same sort of ideology as, like, a CNN host. Like, I, like Don Lemon could have made this shit or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, man. I mean, yeah, it's just so, it is so crazy, man. It's like a, it's like a huge, it, it's just like everyone's in on the same thing, and they're just like, yeah, right, yeah, we're all in this together, and it's like, Art should be very accepting of like other viewpoints. I mean, it's not like, you know, I mean, shit, man. Look at the art of the '60s and shit. I mean, they were fucking in galleries and like slaying pigs and like yeah. painting nude bodies and like it was just all about expression and the body and form and like using your body and expression as like a political voice. And I think like it's just become so off of that, and it's just like everyone's got a goddamn sob story now. You know, and if you're going to go that fucking granular, it's like, well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a white dude and uh, I'm Jewish. And yes, you know, Jewish males have had a fucking long history of the art world and have like, you know, been in power for a long time. And but me personally, I mean, I grew up in fucking southern Indiana, broke as fuck and had to like pry my way out of this fucking hole you know, I left home at 15. I grew up with alcoholic parents. And like, I mean, I'm beyond fucked. Like, I'm like the postmodern, like, like, case 101, man, of just right. fuckness. You know, but I can't, I can't, I can't, like, I can't tell anyone this. I can't be like, this is my position, because like, the, I, I get dismissed. And it's like, I, I think like, you know, I think the class struggle is really missing in the conversation, dude. You know, well, they, I, I yeah. really, really do. Well, they and, hate, and, and, like, poor white Trump voters more than anybody. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's true. And it's just, like, that's what I, I may get lumped into, you know, if I identify, like, I, 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 I don't know. It's just, like, that's what I'll get fucking lumped into. I'm just, like, the other. And, and, and it's, like, for example, like look at somebody like Jonathan Meese or Johanathan Meese, however you pronounce his name. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you know this artist. You know this oh, artist? Oh yeah, I lo I, I'm actually into Meese's work quite a bit. I love his work, man. I mean, and you're like he's just fucking wild style, dude. I love that fucking dirt style. Like whatever the fuck he's doing, making paintings with and for his mother. Like I mean, he's definitely fucking mentally ill. But regardless, like, but he puts iron crosses and fucking swastikas on this shit. You know, not because he supports Nazism, but because, you know, he claims that he wants to take the power away from symbology. And, you know, and he's fine. He's like, he's not canceled. He's untouched. You know, it's just like, well, why can't we take that stance with, you know, outside of that? Why can't we look at this 
you know, with like an unscrutinizing eye sort of, and just yeah. be like, look, dude, we're all humans. We're fucking artists, first of all. We're not carrying fucking cancer. You know, we're, we're not really doing goddamn anything. You know, like, why is the cultural vanguard become this like, this like exclusionary zone it's like it yeah. should be something that like includes a lot of different sort of viewpoints and opinions it shouldn't be like whatever man you know this shit i'm just like preaching this shit but it's just like it's upsetting man it's yeah, like well, super people upsetting like, people i don't know these sort of um i mean there there's certainly these people always have a lot of the people who think like this tend to be like have a certain amount of class privilege. Like the, the broke working class guys I grew up with on Cape Cod are all like Trump voters. And, you know, that's another thing. People think like the average Trump voter was driven by racial resentment. My friends were driven by resentment, but resentment of fucking libtards from New York. Like they just, like they just hate urban libs. Like they, they hate the dismissal that they feel. But I remember like, I mean, decontextualizing symbols is such like a classic art historical trope. And no one, I mean, Nazism was fucking defeated after World War II. It's never mm -hmm. coming back. Like, like uh, uh, you, could have, uh, you could have a million black metal Nazi, not national socialist black metal bands, and they would not be able to create a fascist society they don't have any fucking power it's just like edgelord symbol alienated white morons in their 20s like it's really not that big of a deal but i remember like one of my big turning moments and i think probably a pivotal moment in my career is when daria bahajik's show got canceled uh the one that she did with um boyd rice who has had like far right pseudo connections throughout his career in pioneering industrial musician. And uh, the show was at Greenspawn, I think, but mm -hmm. it was this listserv mm -hmm. of artists of uh, fucking lib lib liberal fag <laughs> artists. <laughs> I forget who was on there, like Anika Yee and Josh Klein. And they all kind of conspired together to get the show canceled. And then the emails got leaked. And in their emails, their proof of Daria's, well, uh, of Daria's specifically fascism was that she had mm -hmm. um, like ruinic imagery, like symbols in her work, which are, you know, were appropriated by the Nazis to a degree. And that she was a noted fan of the industrial band Leibach who also uses Nazi imagery, but are, mm. if they had even done a fucking cursory Google search, they would have found that Leibach are like left communists who have always just like kind of dressed like this as a performer. Like Zizek has written tons and tons about how much he loves Leibach. So not only are these people retarded and gay, they're also fucking lazy as all hell. They can't even put together coherent critiques of what they're trying to say. It drives me insane. I mean, it's just gotten so, yeah, it's, I wanted to say something. Yeah, my, all my family, you know, my, my extended family, I mean, you know, my mom grew up, she's a, she's a school teacher. She's a, uh, you know, she taught in the public school system. She actually taught in prisons um you know kids in prisons at one point and uh you know so she grew up i grew up under her very liberal you know and the rest of our family is in texas and they're huge trump supporters they're huge republicans and i was always taught by my mother that they're terrible people <laughs> they're like <laughs> She's just like, these are terrible people, man. That's kind of how my mom is too, yeah. I mean, yeah, right? I mean, these just don't don't associate yourself. Don't talk to them at the fucking, you know, family reunion. <laughs> like, talk to your aunt. She's she's democratic. And I was like, okay. You know, and, and I remember bringing, like, you know, they, they're they super, they're oil money, wealthy. And they rented a house in Malibu. And this is years ago, I think 2006 or something. And I brought a New York Times to the house. You know, I, I used to get the Sunday Times. And they literally wouldn't let me in the house. They're like, we're not going to let you in until you fucking throw that away. 
They're like, yeah. this is a USA Today only household. Hell yeah. And I was like, I was like, holy shit. I was like, all right. All right. But, you know, you know, I think it's just that sort of like that trickle down boomer mentality that that I that I was given that like it just closed me off, you know, and it was like and but I would hear my family speak and they're fucking intelligent, you know, they were like very articulate and very like well spoken about their points. And I, it was always like admirable. I was always like, yeah, man, it just seems like the, the democratic left at the time was just so fucking unorganized and so, you know, like diaspora that like there was no cohesion. And, yeah. it, and, and you know, it, it was just like, how, why, why am I buying this shit? You know, I'm just so, I'm so fucking broke. And, you know, we lost our house, we lost everything. You know, Petra's mom lost her house in the 2000, you know, financial, 2008 financial crisis. Oh, man. And it's, and it's just like, honestly, like, what have they done for my mom? She's fucking retired. She's broke as fuck. Like, they're not supporting her. Like, she, they, they, like, fucking psyoped her <laughs> into, like, cashing out early on her retirement or some shit. Yeah. So she gets, like, nothing now. And I'm having to support her. And it's like on, on art, it's like so yeah. fucked, you know? Yeah. And I'm just like, what has this system actually done for the people that it purports to, to support? Yeah. And it's, I don't know, man. It's like, it's just mind boggling. Well, one thing that always kind of blows my mind is a lot of the younger artists, especially, and I guess now even middle-aged because everyone does kind of the radical chic cosplay they always seem to concede the fact that electoral politics is fairly meaningless in America, that it really doesn't, that much doesn't change one way or the other. But then when someone says they'd rather vote for the other side, they still freak out. It's like, what if, if it doesn't matter, if life is not going to change for people who need help one way or the other, what does it matter how they, how they vote? Like, it, to me, it kind of blows my fucking mind. Like, I got screamed at a few weeks ago because someone, um, it came up somehow. I was at a gallery. And of course, it was a woman who screamed, you know, women scream. <laughs> uh, but it came up and I was like, nah, nah, I haven't really, I haven't voted since 2008, at least for president. I mean, I supported Bernie Sanders, but yeah. even that in retrospect felt like a waste of time. So um, I was like, but you know, but I was like, if I did vote, I probably would have voted for Trump, you know? Mm. And uh, because like, I, I, as a rejection of cancel culture for one thing, as a rejection of the fact that I saw very clearly that like, these so-called left activists are basically taking like they're they're combining their influence with like tech and Wall Street and the state, and as a rejection of like Democrat hawking foreign policy. I think that's like perfectly three good reasons to choose one lesser evil over the other. Mm -hmm. And yet knowing that electoral politics is meaningless, this girl still goes then you must be a Nazi. Well, how the fuck does that make sense? I'm not voting for Hitler. I didn't even vote. I said, if given the choice, right. I would have went that way. But uh, that to me speaks to a degree of uh, like extreme propagandizing that basically everybody feels that even knowing the reality of the situation they still pick their side and defend it with like that much kind of histrionic, let's call it shrillness, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, can I just say for the fucking record, the enemy is not Trump or Biden or Kamala Harris. The enemy is the fucking corporations, dude. That is the true fucking enemy. And, you know, again, we're all full of contradictions. We're all hypocrites. I mean, I still order shit on Amazon. Like what the fuck? Yeah. Like I have fucking Amazon stock. Like it's, it's like, it's my way out, you know? And just like this whole fucking meme stock shit, you know, it's just like, and the cryptocurrencies is like, is really like, 
people's sort of escape hatch in a way from this bullshit. And it's just like, you know, if anything, Kamala Harris is in the fucking technocrats pocket, dude. And, yeah, you know, she comes out girl. of San Francisco. You know what I mean? It's just like they, I mean, I know the people that want her in office. I know them because they collect my fucking work, you know? Yeah. And, I, and I know their fucking reasoning. And it's just like, look, dude, it's not these, po- it does, it, in that sense, it doesn't really matter. You're not a fucking Nazi. She should be like, okay, so you're against like, you know, corporate fucking mind control. Like, I, I don't know. Like, why isn't the conversation like going there? Yeah. You know, it's just like, it's so, it's just so missing the fucking mark, man. That yeah. like, you know, like all this money that is like going into the, you know, I, I read that, I don't know, I forget the guy's name, the guy that invented Dogecoin, but you know, he went on a fucking rampage of tweets the other day about how cryptocurrency is just like a way for the elite to funnel money upwards and out. And it really kind of is, dude. It's not because it's definitely not it was when it fucking started, you know, was like crypto currency. You know, it's not that anymore. It's just speculative fucking bullshit. And, yeah. you know, it, it's like all these poor retail investors, uh, tools like fucking Robin Hood and shit like that, where it just gamifies losing your fucking life savings, you know, right. uh, it, that that is like the fucking real shit, man. Like, I don't, I don't read anything but fucking Bloomberg news now and, and Drudge Report, <laughs> but you know, and like a series of fucking, you know, uh, substacks and blogs and shit, whatever, and and podcasts. But like, I mean, like it's just all this like leftist stuff has become such a fucking echo chamber that the real, the 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 real shit is just not even mentioned, dude. You know. And it's like, look what's happening in South Africa now. No one's reporting on this shit. Dude. I know, and it's it's insane. total fucking anarchy. Why the fuck is that not on the front page of every fucking major newspaper, dude? I'm talking to my friend out there, and he's like, my wife is going every morning and standing in line at a grocery store for my family and our neighbor's family for fucking rations, and she has to run home because there's a bunch of fucking vigilantes with shotguns in the fucking street stealing people's fucking rations. Like, that is, like, the true fucking fallout of all this shit, dude. Yeah, of you know? course. I mean, yeah. like, I, I, I don't know, dude. So, in a sense, maybe she's right. Maybe you're right. I don't, you know, it's just, like, but the, the real thing I think we should be fighting against is, is this shit. What does that look like? Is that, is that fucking anarchy? Is that libertarianism? I don't know what the fuck it is that's going to fight this, man. But, you know. Yeah. To me, it feels like the fight is fucking over. These fucking, you know, overlords are flying to space to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. They're just like, this is our escape hatch. We don't care anymore. Can't you see? Like, they're basically saying, like, guys, it's done. Like, it's done. You yeah. know, we're done. We're not, we don't care. Burn it down. Totally. All of them. I'm going to mute it for a second and just use yeah, the yeah. bathroom. I'll be right back. Okay, I'll do the same. Yeah. You've been covering up that rice cooker behind you the whole time, man. It's a nice fucking rice cooker. <laughs> yeah, it's mad nice. <laughs> no, man, yeah. sorry to go on this fucking rampage, but like what 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 like, you know, 
what is the what is the answer man like i mean what is is there is there like what is the actual alternative like is it true that like there is actually nothing after capitalism i mean well and no, I mean, sorry I if this so. is like passe. Sorry, this is like a no, passe no, not at all. For you, man. And it's gonna you sound. Um, a lot of my fans will be very disappointed for me to be so cringe right now. But am I being I'm fucking like, cringe? Tell me. No, no, Tell no, me. no. There, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm about to be right now with my okay, orthodox, right. with my orthodoxic kind of viewpoint. Um, I think I'm both very black pilled in that. I think it's going to take a long time for anything to change and that we might probably not even in our lifetimes mm. for better or for worse. But at the same time, these are all contradictions that both Marx and Lenin theorized in the early 20th century. They both said that capitalism at one point would entirely phase out a middle class or a small business owner and that that class would be either folded back into the proletariat or the bourgeoisie. They said at one point that ownership of production would be in such a few small amount of pockets that distribution of wealth would basically stop working altogether, that society mm -hmm. would stop moving. And I think those contradictions are becoming more apparent. Like. Mm -hmm. Capitalism has a way of shifting form and aesthetic for the time. Right now, it's learned to basically swallow its own descent where you have the left basically doing its bidding beneath social justice rhetorical signifiers. But, you know, the way I look at it, feudalism took about 1300 years to collapse. Mm. Capitalism is a more efficient system than that but I don't think it can last forever just because nothing can. The, the question there is if, do you have a working class prepared to take ownership of their own sort of lives and their own society, or does something even like worse come to the fore? But I, I, as cringe as it is to say, I don't think we can really solve anything that we're dealing with anymore through like electoral politics or reforms. I think the only thing that really does work is just like, or might work, I can't say will, is a uh, is revolution at the at the basis, at the economic basis of society. And I hate saying that. I don't want to be like one of these fucking commies who's like, we need revolution. <laughs> But I mean, take, like, take up arms. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But like, <laughs> go to the I, streets. <laughs> yeah. But oh. I do genuinely believe that nothing short of like full scale revolution in an imperialist mm. country like America or the UK mm. that would that would have the ability to kind of go global. Because um, that's how the Soviet Union failed and how Cuba failed is they were not productive countries. They didn't have they didn't even have a capitalist mode of production when the revolution happened. So they never really mm -hmm. even attained a, something resembling socialism. It was more just like a super bureaucratic state controlled capitalism. And because they didn't have their own sort of production capacities, the, the societies fell apart pretty quick. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, I we... go ahead, go ahead. But yeah, I, I think, I think, like, you know, small scale reforms, just like we're, we're past that stage and we can't, we can't come back. Like industrial is, uh, industrial capital is not coming back and we got to march forward, but it's going to be a long, long time until it's like anything remotely stable or functioning. I mean, if we're going to be in some cringe wars here, I'll get, I'll get, I'll get cringe. Um, you know, I think that, you know, <laughs> It's not quite revolution, uh, but but for me, I feel like the true punk at this point. This is so weird to say, and I'm people are gonna hate me maybe, but I think the true punk at this point is to is sort of what Petra and I are doing, where it's like we're we're we had a child, we're having a fucking family, right. we we moved out to the goddamn suburbs, you know. We, we bought a house, we have some assets for our child to, you know, hopefully go on and to have a better life than we did, you know? Yeah. 
and because that is not their trajectory at this point like people are not worse off than their fucking parents and their parents were worse off than their parents and so i think like reversing that is is like the true punk in a way you know yeah, and like and i don't know i mean it's so cringe for me to say it i feel like such a piece of shit but like you know how does that destabilize you know uh, capitalism or how does that like you know bunk against like the the like fucking societal norms like i, well, I don't fucking know you because know because a lot of people a lot capital all that solid melts all that solid will melt you know i love that kind of classic marx's line because people uh genuinely believe something like oh i'm gonna be a they them now you know that's not they think in their mind that it's some sort of rejection of the status quo. But capital has always destabilized social structures, you know? We created like the idea of the nuclear family unit to sort of uphold society, but it was no way going to last like through the totalizing forces of just like, you know, communities sort of eradicated. And even like, you know, uh, the, the non-binary thing, people in their mind will, will be like, oh, I'm so sick, I'm so radical, I'm like, I'm they, them, I'm both, baby, I'm everything. But really, that's just like, people, you know, they're exposed to all these fucking, regular, they're like exposed to these images all day. And then they like are like stacking themselves up to those images. So it starts to just sort of liquidate their psyche. So like all this shit that it, it makes so much sense. To, and even like, like, you know, Michelle and I talk about this. Like if I did have a kid who was like uh, confused about their gender identity, I'd be like, yeah, whatever son, you know, you can wear a fucking dress. You can like have nail polish, but you're not gonna take any fucking drugs and you're sure as shit not gonna get surgery before you're an adult like that's insane but they've I, I normalized agree. this into the discourse like the idea that something so extreme is like normal now that is basically i think capitalism trying to castrate its own subjects to be mm. incapable of rising up in the future i think a fucking confused alienated individuated subject is much weaker and easier to control than people that have stable families that have communities like that's what they don't want to happen so really it is the most radical gesture you could do right now is to just love people and to take care of the people that you need to take care of i fully fucking agree with you dude i mean i think that that's like the that capital, capitalism wants us to fucking fight. They, they just want us to be at odds all the fucking time because yeah. they can make money from this shit. They can be like, there's just so much money to be made on these new trajectories, these sort of like, these, the, you know, uh, Mackenzie Work, I don't know if you, you read her. Oh, but, you know, God. She, Mackenzie has me blocked. <laughs> oh, does she really? <laughs> well, I like the idea. I haven't, like, I just like her idea of the vectors. Like he who controls the vectors controls society. Yeah, yeah. And it's and that to me is like super. I like it. I like it. I mean, maybe you don't agree with it, but like. No, no. I like some of. I've even said before publicly that Mackenzie has some good ideas. Good but ideas. I've also, yeah. I've, yeah, but I've also. Um, you know, my friends. I have a few of my friends who used to be on a Facebook chat with like some serious heavy hitters like Reza, Mark Fisher when he's still alive, like that kind of urbanomic crew. Mm -hmm. And um, Mackenzie Wark was on there when she was still Ken Wark. Mm -hmm. and, um, and back then, you know, Ken was still like, you know, very edgelord philosopher, but they told me like it was around 2013 or so when everyone on the chat was just getting called fascists all the day so i think there was a shift in oh shit in um mackenzie's thinking there but okay so this day, i think she has some good ideas so yeah so i don't know any of that so history aside 
you know, yeah. uh, I, I actually, when I picked up the book, I didn't even know that she was formerly he, to be completely honest. And I just, <laughs> and so I got like 70 pages into this thing and I was like, okay, the Victorialist, that's it. That's all I need from this. Yeah, yeah. You know, and like, I mean, that's how I read. I'll read like, I have fucking thousands of books that I never finish. But, um, Same. but this, but this idea, so politics, Mackenzie's fucking politics aside, let's just take Victorialism out of the whole that whole situation. Yeah. But I think that, I think that that's like, I think it's a very good notion because that's like, like they or he or she or whomever fucking controls these fucking vectors, control society. And it's just like, if you sort of like cut that off and you know, like we're not putting auto on social media and shit because I want him to make his own fucking choices. But if you cut off those fucking vectors, you just snip them. And that, that uh, to me is like upholding family values and is like being like a nuclear family again. Like that, that it's so important, man, because like if, if everyone yeah. started, if, if like in the community that we live in, people do that and Otto can go in the street and play and he's safe and neighbors are watching out for him. And like, you know, it's like a fucking United Colors of Bennington ad on our block. Right. Right? I mean, it's exactly. like, it's every race and creed and fucking age and whatever. You know, and it's, and every, this is like, where we live is so harmonious and it's, it's like, so it's like, whatever, it's peaceful. And it's just because like people actually have fucking values, dude. And I'm not saying that like, if you identify with a they, or if, if you want to do that, you don't have values. That's not what I'm saying. I'll what say I'm that. saying is, no, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course you will. Of course you will. No, but it's just like. I, I don't know, man. I think it once you, if you can uphold that shit, man, you know, then there is truly like hope for <laughs> the future, man, of like, of a revolution of people that have like, you know, like solid thought. Like I was brought up in a fucking, like a horribly tumultuous environment. And like, I like, you know, it took me forever to realize that I'm not actually a piece of shit. And then I can do something <laughs> like Same. that's terrible, man. That's fucking terrible. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to raise my son like that, man. Totally. And you know, that was all, was all the pressures of like, of, of everything, man. Like my mom having to work three fucking jobs, you know, to support a, a sing, as a single mother, a child, you know, and she hardly could do it. And she's fucking mentally ill as a result, dude. Yeah. You know, and she was raised by a mentally ill father and like, it just keeps on going down the line. Of course. And it's like to break that dude is to like introduce values again. Yeah. I don't know. Yes. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is ultra cringe. If you're really like this. No, not at all. Subject. This is great. <laughs> um, I had a similar, I don't want to throw my dad too under the bus, but you know, he was such a fucking womanizer and a, what the fuck do I care? He's never going to listen to this. He doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't get what I do. Uh, An hour in son, I heard you talking about me and I'm fucking <laughs> disappointed. Yeah. But he, uh, you know, he's a womanizer, he was a drunk, he traveled around a lot, so I barely saw him. And I think that is the kind of, no matter what, even if you're like, and I was contemptuous of his decisions when I was a kid, but I still think they kind of wear, they still sort of seep into you, like what, the, you know, your father or whoever you modeled yourself after his tendencies, that's shit I still have to contend with to this day. like decadence and doing whatever the fuck I want, not caring about other people. It's, it's like a constant struggle. You know, you should check out though, mm. on this, on this issue, Ivan Illich. I've been okay. really, really digging his work after my, uh, Nina Power, the philosopher, she got me into his writing, but he was like, um, even though he wasn't an avowed Marxist, I think it's close to say that like he's very economically, at least socialist, but he was very um, socially conservative. And he had this, and this is in the 70s, he was saying like, um, if you want to oppose capitalism, then you have to, then you should actually want to uphold traditions. You should have like a conservatism to you. He had this book about he even like, he has one book actually called Gender and he actually theorized that within the next decades, capitalism would eradicate the gender binary uh, 
in not an emancipatory way, but in a way that is actually destabilizing society. Um, mm. And he also has a great one about uh, the education system, which is just so fucking good. The way that mm. education is less a educational force than a force of inculcation and propaganda, uh, which I absolutely loved. But I did want to ask you while we're still here, because I guess we'll just like, because we're going to be working on it. Um, mm. you got a you got a book coming out, and I'll be doing a text for it. And um, is this going to be your entire career, or since your transition to uh, painting and sculpture? Yeah, I mean the book is coming out with H uh, and B Press um, uh, next spring, and it's a tome, man. It ended up being it's going to be like four hundred pages. And it's, it's just mainly it's my return to painting and sculpture uh, from 2014 to like 2020. Uh, there are some inserts of like past work that I've done. Like there's some performance work and video work and like uh, there's this auction catalog. Uh, it was a Phillips auction catalog. I don't know if you saw that shit, but it's like I put McDonald's on each page. I made like McDonald's yeah. compositions and then rephotographed the catalog. So that's in there, some a portion of that. Um, yeah, but it's just mo mostly painting and sculpture, man. And just that sort of return. I mean, I realized that like, you know, I, I took like a 13 year hiatus from, from painting uh, and did all this fucking crazy shit. Uh, and then I came back to it. I was, I, I was like, painting is like very fucking real to me, man. It's like very psychological and very like spiritual. And I couldn't handle it, dude. I couldn't handle like looking at myself. Therefore, I couldn't handle painting. And so I had yeah. to like project outward. And, you know, I was also a fucking total drunk. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. you know, like that's, that's what I was doing for those years. And then, you know, I quit drinking and I fucking realized that I could return to like this introspective sort of form of work. And yeah, so that's what it is, man. You know, I return to that shit. Do you think, um... Do you think, all right, just, just to set this up, because like when I'm writing, it's both, even if it's not about myself, I guess it is about myself, but I often find that um, I'm like, I'm like becoming a character or something. Like it's like a caricaturized version of myself, like an idealized version of myself who's like, ultra provocative like doesn't give a fuck what anyone thinks like sort of and then like you know i, I wash away the things that i'm actually insecure about like but the, but at the same time like the insecurities are still there because those are the things that i'm consciously trying to leave off the leave out of the text do you find that um when you're painting and working in this more introspective manner that um, that the sort of character we project in more narrative-based art sort of collapses and, and it's like a more pure projection of your subjectivity? Yeah, I mean, you know, I was talking with Aaron Moulton, who's also writing a piece in the book, and we were talking about it in relation to sort of the prism, you know, and I was thinking about like a, like a multifaceted sort of prism and how light enters it and then just sort of like uh, gets disseminated through all these different uh, facets. And, you know, for a long time, man, I was like playing a character of a character of a character. I was just so fucking lost in like who the fuck I was. Yeah. Um, like it, it, it almost felt like uh, Peter Sellers or something where you just sort of like, Mm -hmm. delve into this character and you can't get the fuck out and then yeah. that one leads into the next one and the next one and pretty soon you're so far away from like who you actually are spiritually and like uh, the grounding the ground just fucking disappears and so when yeah like when I paint it's it's like the for me it's like the most pure fucking space that I could exist in 
I mean, I, I sound, it sounds so crazy and like, it, I mean, but it's like, it truly, I like lose myself. I mean, it's like eyes roll in the back of the head kind of vibe, dude. I mean, I'm like in a trance state, you know, and it's like, it's very like, I'm not trying to be, I mean, for a while in the earlier work, when I first started, I felt like a, I felt like a, I needed to sort of give a nod to art history. And so I did all these underpaintings of, of ma like old master's works. And then yeah. I would basically deface them. I would basically then become another character and just do some fucking crazy shit over top of them. Right. And, uh, you know, I was, again, I was like of two minds a and it really, it, it was still, it was still like, it was still way too complicated. And, and then like over the pandemic, I just, I, I really like, I took up, to be honest, I like took up meditation. I got into a program, I got into AA and I got a sponsor and I started working the steps and like, you know, I mean, I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, AA is a fucking cult and this and that, but I, I'm with like a, a good group of guys and it's fucking good, dude. And, you know, w w there, there was a lot of fucking psychological breakdown. Petra and I had a kid you know, at one point she turned to me and she said, everything you do annoys me. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I was like, I was like, shit has got to change. We went to um, a, a couple's therapy and it was a fucking trash fire, dude. And like, it just like, she just wanted to fucking keep us there and charge us 300 bucks a fucking hour forever. And, and, and I was like, okay, fuck this. We're going to quit. Let's save the money for auto. Let's not like, let's not do this. I will work on myself. And so I started a meditation practice through blue throat yoga. It's mantra based. And I started going to AA and I, I personally have never felt closer to like the true, my true sense of like who I am, the core of the fucking, the, the heart stone, if you will, you know? And from that, it's like a fucking well of like realness, dude. And yeah. I can really, I don't, I don't need to represent anything. And that's why the paintings now are like super abstracted. It's just like, I don't need to illustrate an idea that it just, it just fucking is. And that's why like, I'm looking at like, you know, painters like Car Carol Appel and fucking, I mean, Sigmore Polka is somewhat illustrative, but like even like what Kippenberger stands for, or, um, you know, like all these fools. Uh, but it's just for me right now, it's that pure fucking expression, that sort of place. And I don't know, man, maybe that's fucking, maybe I'm just like a horribly cringe human being. Nah, <laughs> like, nah. Again, I feel like this is like where I want art to go, man. You know, this, I just want it to be fucking pure again. I'm a purist. Yeah, yeah. It's supposed to, well, I mean, it's supposed, it's supposed to be a place of like self accept, self. I don't know, self-exploration, but also um, self-critique in a way, reflection. But it is interesting because I, I, you know, I'm looking at the paintings behind you right now and they're, they're terrific. And I've been like pining for abstraction for a long time now, just because we're in this kind of, I feel like even at painting shows now, it's always some like 22 year old kid who's just like painting something that like a, a screenshot from the internet. And some people do that like really well. Mm -hmm. And then other people, not so much, but I, I am, I think there'll probably be more people sort of looking to just kind of put energy down on the canvas in the next few years. Even myself, to be honest, like I, I, I feel like I'm boxed in to a certain degree in a little way because everybody just wants to hear me like rant about uh, libtards and such. But I mean, that's not like my sole quest in life. The, the point is mm. to, uh, I feel like once you point something out and you have like a critique and you know where you stand, then you want to transcend your own kind of resentment and I'm hoping that's what happens with my own book that's coming out because it is kind of like an encrypted self-reflection or an encrypted addiction memoir to an extent. Um, were you, so was booze your main thing or did you fuck around otherwise? No, I mean, like I was a fucking good old boy, man. I yeah. drank Bud Light, you know, and uh, Jameson. 
and uh like i never got into pills i never got i fucking actually hated cocaine dude i fucking mm. hated it i'm not a big and fan I, either but i did it a ton yeah i, I just I, you know and even weed like like I, I would smoke weed only when I was like fucking super drunk and then I'd get the spins and end up vomiting on myself. Um, you know, but like, <laughs> I mean, it was just a fucking piece of shit. But like weed made me feel, if I didn't drink on it, I felt so insecure and, and so like questionable in life. Of like, course. I, could, yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't even like look someone in the eyes. I was like, why am I still doing this? So yeah, no, it was just fucking like Bud Light and whiskey, dude. Like yeah. fully. You know, yeah. occasionally, occasionally ever clear <laughs> the straight shit. <laughs> yeah. You know, so no, I never, never got into that shit. Right. All right, all right, all right. So, while Adam is away, let's talk about his house. He's got a really expensive faucet over there, <laughs> and that rice maker I know is expensive. And look at the mix uh, between, we, we, we have like, we have like old fake Monet mixed with all my oh, I know. And, that, yeah. and that beautiful Ikea lamp, you know, just to, you know, shine bright, that horrible green exactly. light that you get from it. <laughs> Dude, we like, I don't know, we, it's hard to keep this place neat because we're still living in the wreckage of like Michelle's mom stuff. This is the apartment she grew up in. Mm. We moved in uh, during the pandemic because her mom moved to San Francisco. So, but she still has all her shit here. So we have like, there's like so much closet space that we can't even use. It's fucking brutal. That, that's fucking annoying. Yeah, I but, was in Washington wanted, Heights. Yeah, go ahead. I, I just wanted to say one more thing about painting in that for, for painting for me, man, you know, is it's, it's more of a verb than it is a noun. You know, and I think that like painting right now in its current state is very much so a noun, mm. you know, and, you know, I, I don't know, I'm looking to make it more verb like and it's like, you know, so that's why I can identify with like action painting and, you know, like that performance side of me comes out in it and, you know, even people like Olin, like, you know, where he's, he, he's so funny, dude, he's just like, I make the next painting just slightly better than the past painting. Or sorry, I make the next painting slightly worse than the past painting, so the past painting will sell. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. You, you know, I, yeah, I don't know, man. I just think that, uh, yeah, anyhow, that's that. All right, man. I think this is a, uh, a great place to leave it. For sure. It's been fucking good, dude. Yeah, man. Mark, thanks so much for coming on the show. We will we'll talk to you again soon, I'm sure. Good luck on your book, dude. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, When's it come out? Uh, September 30th, if we stick to the schedule. I'm like putting finishing touches on it right now. I can't believe Rizzoli's publishing it. That's fucking amazing. <laughs> <I'm just kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> Rizzoli would rather me uh... buried, buried alive than work with me. You know, some like this friend of mine, uh, Roger Hain, incredible filmmaker. Like this kid, if he came up in the 90s, he'd be like Taz Salons, Vincent Gallo. He has that sort of particularly American indie surrealist uh, 90s kind of vibe. And he just did Love this it, incredible dude. movie that he self-financed. But he, hyper allergic, was going to publish an interview with him and they they didn't have a writer for it so he reached out to me he's like hey man will you interview me for for hyper allergic i'm like I, they fucking hate my guts you should like ask them you know first if they want if they want my name on that website so he's like all right he asked them and the editor just wrote back absolutely not <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, All right, Mark. It must feel good to be hated so much, man. Must just yeah, it's yeah. Fun. It's like it's like it's rejuvenate. It's like exciting in some ways because it means your work's getting some attention. And then, but when you see people like straight up just lying about you on the internet, there's always that jolt of like, "Fuck you!" I'm gonna, you know. Yep. But it's all good. All right.
I'm going to turn off the recording, but I want to ask you a couple more questions about. Yeah, yeah.